Hello, everyone. Thanks for turning up on a rainy day. Um, I want today to identify a set of challenges that I think are underlying the Australian state, consider their implications on uh, current politics, proffer a rationale for change, and most critically, make some suggestions about how positive change could come. I need to thank Arnie Joy Murphy, Arnie Dye Kerr, Arnie Caroline Briggs, and all of the other elders in Melbourne uh, who have welcomed me with open arms. Um, I'd also like to pay homage excuse me, to great intellectual philosophers and elders like Uncle Joe McGuinness, Arnie Lilla Watson, Arnie Mary Graham, Uncle Rob Anderson, Uncle Jim Berg, Arnie Joan Vickery, Arnie Maggie Hodgson, Uncle George and Arnie Maud Tongary, and many others. I've been privileged to learn from these people. I also happily acknowledge my, acknowledge my white and Asian and other um, ancestors for um, teaching me and stewarding me through the hoops of white and other values, cultures and rites of passage. There are three major challenges facing the Australian state. Genocide and its denial, the values of whiteness and unchecked greed dressed up as democracy. The first two problems are psychological and social in nature and play out in very real ways in the current Australian politics, body politic. It's on these, genocide and whiteness, that I'd like to ponder today. I do make some observations about the final problem, unchecked greed, yet I do shake my head sometimes at what we might do to address it. But actually, I think there are some very real things that we as citizens can do. So the convicts turned up here as outcasts rejected and isolated from their homelands and its peoples. In their rejection and isolation from the motherland, they found some comfort in the arms of Aboriginal peoples. But when Aboriginal peoples got in the way of their chance to make something better for themselves, to turn from being seen as convicts or as criminals to being seen as landowners, then the embrace of Aboriginal peoples was no match for their chance for redemption. Their pain turned into greed. Stealing the land and murdering children was simply a side effect of bettering themselves in the colonial economy. Genocide occurred here in Australia. It hasn't been acknowledged. As a nation, we've said sorry, and a couple of prime ministers have rightly acknowledged some of the massacres and murders. But has this reality sunk into the soul of Australia? Have we chewed on it, grieved it, admitted it, atoned, made change, written the word in our history books? Have we memorialised? Have we committed to never again? Not really. We tend to hope that it goes away and that Aboriginal people all stop whinging. Apparently that's what we're doing when we speak the truth. As a country, we admire Germany, Japan. We memorialise the war of, and the war atrocities that the Anzacs suffered. But we have um, a, a deep sense of shame about admitting war and atrocities here in Australia. It prevents us from changing for the better as a nation. Our soul as a country is still unhealed. But white people are good people, like all of us. Some, somewhere deep in your heart, you wish for the right thing to be done, to atone, to heal, to make it better for everyone. It's just the way that many white people, not all, but many white people attempt to make things better for and to Aboriginal peoples is a product of the same diseased motivation of shame and guilt. I'm hoping one day as a nation we can look seriously into the mirror, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, so we can actually move on. See, Aboriginal people actually want to move on. We don't want to be stuck in the 1800s and harp on about genocide forever. The only reason we speak that truth is because the rest of the country doesn't want to admit it. If the rest of the country admits it, then we'll be able to move on. Most white people want to change us on their terms. They want to heal us, change us, educate us, house us and help us, like 18th century nuns almost, but really they want to control us. They want to make us conform to their values and ways of living. We want to move on, on our terms, or even shared terms. Imagine that. The Northern Territory intervention was about many white people being in denial about sexual abuse and alcoholism in their own communities, preferring to keep it under wraps, and being horrified that it was visible in someone else's backyard. It wasn't that alcoholism and sexual abuse were occurring in Aboriginal communities that was necessarily the problem. If it was, there were very scarce health resources deployed. It was that alcoholism in some Aboriginal communities was visible. It reminded whites of their own alcoholism. So they sought to control it and us. 
They projected their horror and fear, claiming that they were saving us, all the while denying sexual abuse and alcoholism in the suburbs, cities and towns across white Australia. But let's hope the Royal Commissions and inquiries into sexual abuse in the armed forces, the national alcoholism crisis confronting white Australia, perhaps these are good steps forward. Admission is the first step. Change is harder, but not impossible. So if genocide and its implications, so, sorry, if genocide and denial occurred here, what is the vector, what is the thinking or the juice that allows this ongoing fallacy to be denied? What are its implications? I've mentioned shame and guilt as motivating factors, but I'm also wanting to focus on uh, the feelings of, uh, or the values of whiteness and neoliberalism. I think these two factors are critically important to discuss as well. Whiteness is the set of values, the mindset. It doesn't refer necessarily to white people, but it does refer to the values, the mindset, as Bourdieu would say, the habitus, that white is always right. These values include science as religion, religion as control, and inequality as normal and acceptable. Thomas King, the revered First Nations scholar from Canada, stated that race was a divine sanction, a scientific certainty, and an economic imperative and that this thinking still continues. Science is apparently objective, value-free and gold standard. Bullshit. Science is as culturally bound and Eurocentric as cricket is for drunks. Religion is apparently for the faithful. Organised religion is for people who want to control others. There's no doubt that spirituality and faith are wonderful pursuits and attributes that we should all aspire, and sometimes we might even happen upon those things in organised religion. But organised religion tries to monopolise those attributes and control people, mostly women. Inequality and poverty is apparently preordained, normal and acceptable. In many cultures where they've given up their spiritual love for each other to the greed of the corporations, it's now apparently just the way things are, that people in broad meadows and Dumaji have less food to eat, less healthy food, and are generally less resourced in their schools. Apparently the open market economy and democracy are the same thing. Bullshit. We have capitalist oligarchies now, a handful of billionaires worldwide who control governments, churches and corporations and the media. They work together to maintain control. It's called neoliberalism, or more simply, greed. Of course, whiteness is not the premise of white people alone. It comes from there. But whiteness and neoliberal values are now accepted in countries as diverse as China, South Africa, Japan, the USA, Russia, and Chile. These countries all worship the god of greed above human rights, social justice, and equality. They see profits and fairness as incompatible, or that inevitably one of those must prevail. It's not that the market economy in and of itself is a bad thing. Socialist countries prefer state control as well. It's just that market economy greed has taken over true democracy. So these values of whiteness and neoliberalism are why many white people want to intervene and help Aboriginal people on white terms. Many white people don't even know they have culturally bound values and thus see themselves as normal and everyone else as other or strange. They can't see their own values or the limitations of them. They can't understand why Aboriginals, why we want help, but not the kind of help that maintains white power and black poverty. That is, white people will help if they remain in power. If they continue to dominate the apparatus of state, the terms of power, the terms of interaction, the terms of government, of law, of equality, if they write the history books, then they're only too gracious to offer us some scraps from their table. Apparently we should grovel and be thankful to white miners for raping our lands without our permission, and then graciously offering us some traineeships. Reconciliation in Australia has become a movement of making white people feel good about doing charity for Aboriginal people. It's not a movement of substantive social justice or truth. It's not about peacemaking. It's about including Aboriginal people on white powerful terms of benevolence. Constitutional recognition is not about substantive equality, social justice or true wealth and power sharing. It's about wiping out Aboriginal sovereignty and enfolding us into white rules of occupation, into the white state as it exists. The values and whiteness and neoliberalism may mean, when he, sorry, may mean many white and some new Australians cannot see Aboriginal people as anything other than a problem. I think that's what Joel, uh, Noel Pearson and Tony Abbott are, are on about, that um, 
We're, we're problem children who need strict fathers. But here's the rub. The same, value that are, the same values that are oppressing Aboriginal people are oppressing ordinary whites and new Australians as well. The values of whiteness and neoliberalism, or greed at any costs, work together to maintain corporate control of the world economy. If that is true, what hope do ordinary citizens of the world, you and I, let alone Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or other political minorities, have in bringing about true equality? Well, I think in any chaotic situation there are opportunities. I don't want to dwell on, dwell on the problems here. I do want to propose how they be shifted. But first I want to think about why they should be shifted. I'm reminded by Auntie Lilla Watson's powerful dreaming. If you have come to help me, she says, then you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us walk together. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are actually world leaders. Our spiritual and philosophical traditions have served us well. We've only survived the onslaught of colonisation and its continuing effects because of our values and beliefs. Some people can't or think that we don't have any values and beliefs or traditions that exist anymore because they're not necessarily visible. But actually, those very same values will serve the whole of Australia well if the Australian state is ready for them. Our values and traditions are actually the essential missing link in human sustainability, both environmental and economic. Our survival systems correctly link social cohesion to political autonomy, economic stability, economic sustainability and environmental balance. The modern world's, ch the modern world's challenges of drought, poverty, obesity, cancers, war and greed can be fixed or ameliorated if we listen to that still small voice within. Most elders have not forgotten this still small voice within. They call it the truth. Many hold on to it and share it, and they will share it when the world is ready to hear it. But it would be irresponsible of them to share that knowledge if the state is not ready. If Australia respectfully atoned, set ourselves on a course for positive change and implemented instruments of power and resource sharing, then Australia would have the edge over China or any other world power. We would be truly confident resting on our own laurels in the family of nations. We would enact and cheerfully share the elements of a new Australian nation state, a republic like no other. The republic is our opportunity to dream, to remake the nation state, where, greed, and where uh, greed doesn't rule, but economic sustainability does. Where environmental growth rules, not degradation. Where we have social equity, not poverty. And where citizen state power sharing and not capitalist oligarchy are the mainstays of our traditions. But in less lofty ways, the need to bring about true power and resource sharing in Australia between Aborigines and others is essential if we want our tax dollars to work. If Aboriginal communities share decision-making power over government programs, they work better, and the international evidence supports that. If Aboriginal communities have measures of self-government and self-control, there is less youth suicide. The evidence strongly supports that. So you see, power and resource sharing must be jointly agreed, not doled out from one party to the other. But perhaps the greatest reason for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people sharing power is what Paul Keating referred to when he said the greatest issue facing Australia today is a psychological one, securing our future place in Asia, not from it. Aboriginal white relations are inextricably linked to Australian-Asian relations by virtue of notions of race, ownership and place. We cannot be confident in Asia unless we are confident at home. Power sharing is deeply psychological. It means some white Australians may have to give up their deep attachments to Mother England and Father USA. We'll have to grow as a nation on our own two feet. We can always revere our psychological parents, visit them, pay homage to them, include some of those traditions in our new state. But actually, what if our grandparents, Aboriginal people, what if white Australians saw Aboriginal people and Aboriginal elders as their own elders? What if we reimagined Aboriginal people as people we could actually learn something from? How radical. What if white Australians started seeing Aboriginal sacred sites as what they are, 
the oldest records of human history on earth, rather than opportunities for graffiti and pillage? What if white Australians and others with the diseases of whiteness and neoliberalism and greed started seeing Aboriginal people as the holders to humanity, holders of the keys to humanity's survival? Maybe then we wouldn't be scared of people with dark skin. Maybe then we wouldn't be scared of Asia and Asians. Maybe we could hear the Indonesians properly when they ever so graciously tell us to stop being so rude as to dump asylum seekers on their shores with no agreement. Maybe we could see asylum seekers as something other than scavengers. Maybe we would treat them the same as we would treat white asylum seekers. Maybe we could hear Aboriginal people when they tell us how to manage fires and drought. Maybe we could hear Aboriginal people when they tell us how to deal with difficult problems like sexual abuse, forced adoptions, alcoholism and comprehensive primary health care. Our peoples are actually intellectual and political leaders in these fields. These, my friends, are our opportunities for change, and they are our rationale. But I want to state clearly that I'm not advocating separatism. The redress of colonisation and power imbalance is not for two parties to develop separately. The opposite of white power is not black power. The opposite of white power dominating over us is black and white people sharing power together equally. Fortunately or unfortunately, we need each other. I'm not sure why the ancestral beings, gods or creator or universal history put us together in this accident of time and space here in Australia, but here we are. We've tried a couple of hundred years of dom dominance and recently a few years of benevolence, but it's not substantive equality. It's not equal power and resource sharing on equal terms. It's not peacemaking after the wars have been settled. The war rages just silently and benevolently now killing us softly. But change will come through a series of things. First, white people must admit genocide, atone and take responsibility to change. That might take 10 years. At the same time, Aboriginal people must deal with our demons, give up any lingering victimhood we might have and see ourselves as owning the nation state. This is our country and we need an equal share in it with all the responsibility that implies. As Ramfeli from South Africa has so eloquently suggested, we have to prepare ourselves to govern. But that doesn't mean Aboriginal people should be viewed with benevolence to lift us up to the standards of white governance. It means that governance could perhaps be shared. Secondly, Australia should begin a national dialogue about the values that we want this country to have. What do we want a modern repu republic to look like? We need to look deeply into a historical, sociological and political memory compare ourselves to other republics. We can be better than the USA model of republicanism. We can be better than the Westminster style of democracy. We can be better than any socialist state in the world. We have the opportunity to create a new state, something that is truly respectful of equality for all. Some of these values could include immense pride in the oldest human heritage on earth. We could include and make sure that the republic uh, the movement for a new republic must be a grassroots one of and for all of the peoples. We could uphold economic survival as a green economy. They don't have to be in opposition to each other. And we could uphold Aboriginal wisdom and Western science as sacrosanct. We could perhaps even consider that sport, art and philosophy are all important values. And most importantly, the value that we all need to hold dear is the great red landscape itself the great red land and its waters. That's the uniting feature that we all must revere. When we've seriously progressed this work and dialogue, only then are we ready to begin debating the components of what a new republic might look like. We have to make peace with the rest of the country. Sorry, Aboriginal people have to make peace with the rest of the country, or more correctly, the rest of the country need to make peace with us. Um, and secondly, then we can uh, debate what a new republic should look like. These things are inseparable. To form a new republic or begin debating its components without address addressing peacemaking between black and white Australians would be a serious mistake. It would mean once again that Aboriginal people are relegated to the sidelines while the instruments of state were negotiated. But conversely, to make peace with Aboriginal peoples without addressing issues like whiteness, neoliberalism and greed will consign not just Aboriginal, but all Australians 
to a very unhappy future in a desert of psychogeopolitical confusion about race, ownership and place. We will not know ourselves. In terms of negotiating peace between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians, various options could be considered. Whatever option is chosen, there will be certain principles that should be sacrosanct. Nation to nation in terms of recognition, as I've outlined, self-governance for Aboriginal people, and the flexibility for adaptation to local agreement making and representation. The weakest option for peacemaking between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples would be constitutional recognition where the good charitable white parliament would include us in their constitution. How benevolent. No matter how strong the articles were, they would still guarantee the power of the Crown as a singular sovereign power and relegate us to secondary status as merely a group of concerned citizens. They would never guarantee us equal power and resource sharing. And as I said previously, the current constitution guarantees power for rich, white, greedy men, not everybody else. The second strongest option would be a treaty or formal agreement between the Australian state and Aboriginal peoples. As I've said elsewhere, this may include nation to nation negotiations, but the prince, that very important principle risks being watered down in implementation by virtue of it needing to be recognised or subsumed into the current Australian constitution. Again, this is not equal power sharing and it's not equal resource sharing. Look no further than North America and New Zealand to see that treaties are simply documents the Crown ignores when it feels like it. Others have suggested the establishment of an Aboriginal state or autonomous region, similar to Nunavut in Canada or Norfolk Island here in Australia. These options require serious investigation and have some merit, although they would need to solve the very real issue of the geographic diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and that whatever particular piece of land was chosen, uh, it wouldn't be the traditional country for all of us. Still, the possibility of it being a virtual autonomous government or state could have serious benefits. But I think by far the strongest option to consider peacemaking is a new republic based on dual sovereignty. Dual sovereignty would enshrine the power of both the oldest living cultures on earth and their essential place in a new nation state and the strength of Western and other traditions and values. Why can't we equally share resources and power? Why can't we equally share resources and power? That might be a naive question perhaps, but only if you accept white male greed as inevitable. Before we start arguing about a directly elected president or a parliamentary appointed one, or other similarly ego fueled and vacuous arguments in relation to the Republic, as I said before, we must have had completed the hard work of truth telling, atonement and national values dialogues as the essential foundations for negotiation. When we've done that work, then we have an opportunity to dream of a new model for the Republic. We can take the best from Aboriginal traditions of survival and governance, the traditions of Westminster democracy, the USA model of a republic, as I've mentioned before, which incidentally is stolen from the Iroquois um, Native American peoples and their system of participatory democracy, and other models of representation. Let's build something brave and new, yet old and enduring. I've said elsewhere the components of a new Australian state could be based on dual sovereignty, Citizenship, sorry, I need to clarify that. Dual sovereignty, where a new constitution guarantees power and resource sharing between the national parliament and an Aboriginal autonomous parliament. Citizenship participation in pre-selecting candidates in parliamentary budgets and expenditure review. An Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander president, a great way of both tangibly and symbolically sharing power and presenting to the world pride in our new national identity. A national parliament and prime minister, similarly to what we have, where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are encouraged to run for election. An Aboriginal parliament, as I mentioned, which jointly negotiates with the other regular parliament. New Australians should get their citizenship from local Aboriginal elders and local MPs as representatives of equally sovereign parties. We should have a national commitment to the human family and all of its cultures. We should establish a trust fund where 2.5% of GDP would, direct, would be directed for the autonomous management and control by the Aboriginal Parliament for the maintenance of identity, land and cultures. Other programs like health, education, housing, employment and justice 
uh, for Aboriginal people should be directed by the Aboriginal Parliament, but jointly implemented by the existing bureaucracy and Aboriginal parliamentary officers. We should have a new flag representing both black and white symbolism, and we should have a new national anthem representing Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal sounds. To summarise, as a nation, we must confront, confront, admit and atone for genocide, interrogate and free ourselves of the inevitability of whiteness and neoliberal greed, and begin a national dialogue about shared values and beliefs. We must make peace between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. Only then will we, be, will we be mature enough to negotiate the precepts of a new republic where dual sovereignty is enshrined. Only then can we take our rightful place among the family of nations. Then our land and waters will sustain us confidently in Asia and the rest of the world. We will be stronger to face the immense global environmental and political challenges we all do. Thanks.